Hey everybody, welcome back to Nuvidian's channel and today we're looking to the difference between server components and lazy hydration. So we'll figure out what these two things are, what the main differences are, and of course what's better for your use case out there. Let's go! Server components have been around for a while in Nux.js, though only in experimental state. And lazy hydration is quite new in Nux.js, but was brought to Vue 3.5, so quite a bit ago. Nevertheless, we have both available and both help to do less on the client side when we don't need to, so to say. But there are important differences and when you want to use one over the other. So we'll dive into what exactly these are. But before we have to cover what these things actually are, lazy hydration server components, just briefly and of course how they work internally. So let's start with that. Let's start with lazy hydration. And technically you should already know what it is all about because there was a video I made about it a couple weeks ago. If you haven't checked it out, please do so. Link is in the description and in the corner as usual. But still, here's a quick wrap up. Hydration is only relevant when you use SSR. Same actually for server components. So yeah, if you don't use SSR, you don't have to bother. But if you use SSR, well, then you definitely have to look into these things. So when the initial request happens, then of course you get the HTML, the inline CSS, and the serialized state first from the server. The server itself, well, basically runs your whole application for that certain page that was requested and renders all the components in one big string, and then of course sends it out. But then the site is visible to the client, but that's not all, of course. We have a lot of things to do, like well, downloading, executing the JavaScript, attach the listeners, and so on and so on. And then the site is interactive, right? When basically Vue and Nuxt has booted up and replayed, so to say, all the components on the client side. So also run through the setup function, run things again, take over the state that's already existent and was sent over from the server, but still doing a lot of things under the hood. And of course, there's also some client side logic that's applied there. And the thing between the red bars, as you might already know, is called hydration. So there is something here to worry about. Because if you do this for your whole application, well, this can be quite costly if you have a lot of components. And to be fair, not all components have to be hydrated. Well, until now they had to, but with lazy hydration, they don't have to anymore. Because you can just say, if things are static, why would you hydrate them? There is nothing interactive, then don't do it. It's fine. Or do that later. So like when they run to the viewport or maybe when the browser's idle, everything below the fold, you can do later on. There's still some compromise to make because if you do it too late, so to say, then the IMP value, so to say, the interaction to next pane might suffer and the user experience might be worse. Because if you say have bad internet connection, then load the component um, and then actually execute the JavaScript, well, that's, that's a trade-off you have to decide and to see what works for your site best. That's also not the topic of the video, but it's still important to mention. To make hydration lazy, you can use certain directives now in Nux.js. So something like hydrate never to just say, okay, it's static content, it's fine, it will never be hydrated. Or to do things like, oh, as I said before, when it comes into viewport or whenever you trigger a certain ref, change that, set it to true, then hydrate components. And that's pretty powerful. But that's also only the whole story. But keep in mind that hydration is only relevant for the first request. We'll come to that in a bit, but so far I think that's enough information for lazy hydration to make things work. Now let's talk about server components. Before we dive into that, we have to cover something called island architecture because this is a common pattern and we do the same for server components, but just the other way around. Patterns.dev has this wonderful chart comparing typical SSR to progressive hydration to, well, island architecture, where you also see, okay, fair, progressive hydration, also lazy hydration is what we've just explained, so to say. And island architecture is quite different from that because here, things are static first, so server rendered, and they're static and they will stay static. And then only interactive components are actually hydrated and have JavaScript attached. Now, this is the island architecture and frameworks like Astro, of course, use that technique because they are static first. But with Nuxt, well, we can't really do that as we are not a static first framework, so to say. We can remove all the JavaScript from a page. That's not a problem. And now with server components, we can just go the opposite route. And this even leaves the door open for a similar approach in the future while saying the root of the application is a server component, so it is static and everything else that needs to be interactive, you can change. But how does it actually work? As I just mentioned, it is more as the reversed island architecture or lakes architecture, some people call it, where you say, okay, everything is interactive except some static parts. Now, to actually understand how that works, it's not a difficult. If you have something that should be always static or maybe has part of it that should be interactive eventually or like slots or child components, what you do is you do a request to the server 
the server will render the component, giving you the HTML, so there's no JavaScript involved. And then from that HTML that you get, it's basically inserted into the document. It's a bit easier to explain when you dive into the internals of the Nuxt Island component, which we'll do right now. This component is around 300 lines of code, and it's fine if you don't understand everything here. That's totally okay. Also, take your time to read through the source code yourself because, well, it's open source and the link's in the description. But basically, the idea is whenever we have some kind of server component, we have a few regexes where we also set UIDs to make sure, okay, we can identify the islands. And of course, also for slots, for fallbacks, and so on, so on. There are some thoughts of maybe using an AST-based approach, but that's still in the making. Nevertheless, here we go. So besides UID generation, as I said, to make sure, okay, we have a way to identify components, we of course need to load a component. And as mentioned before, well, how we do that, we have a load component function further down below where the idea is, okay, somewhere we have a fetch function and maybe start with this. It's called in this case event fetch to use the event.fetch function if necessary, if you're on the server side, just so every information from the server side is kept like headers, cookies, and so on and so on. Also, I made a video about that if you're interested in, well, keeping this information while doing subsequent calls. And of course, then otherwise, we can just use global this fetch or fetch.raw to work things around. Nevertheless, what is further happening? We have this event fetch, so let's take a look where this is actually used. And we have, of course, that function called underscore fetch component, where we fetch the HTML for a component. So we get the response, we say, okay, let's get a query this is how you basically send over props and other values. And eventually, well, we say based on Nuxt Island, that's where the island renderer is, that renders a certain component out with the HTML necessary. Then, well, we do that request, we're fine. We either attach the base URL if it's not running on just slash, right, wherever your application is running, some context, some props, and so on. And eventually we fetch the content, we check a few more things, we set the payload, and we're good. And from that fetching itself, which happens down here, right, we'll get the response, and then we set the HTML that comes from that response, already inserting the UID for the island component. Now, the interesting part, this SSR HTML later on is being used, of course, to create further down, skipping a bit more, a whole component. So the idea is, of course, if there's an error or no HTML, well, you want to render a fallback slot with an error value. Otherwise, you create a virtual node. So basically say, okay, let's build up with more, more or less a little render function, our view component, and eventually insert the HTML further down in the component. And then of course, there are a few things to work around that also client components work in there. There's some magic going on, as I said, worth checking out the source code for a few more details. But the TLDR is fetching the whole thing from the server and inserting it in the component, which means there is no hydration for it. There is no JavaScript cost involved except this one general component, the Nuxt Island component, that does all that magic for you, so to say. But if you have a lot of server components, well, that cost is something you can offset, right? And that also means there is as little JavaScript involved as possible, which is technically none besides that one component. That's already a difference to hydration. And maybe we should take a look at it now in our demo application. To show the difference between lazy hydration and server components, of course, I've set up an almost minimal Nuxt application. We just have some styles, of course, and a compatibility date set up. And then we have almost equal pages here, one lazy and one called server component. We also have an index.view to just link to them. Okay, let's have a look at these pages. So we have index.view where we say, okay, Nuxt link to slash lazy slash other, no prefetch because we don't want to prefetch the JavaScript there. By default, Nuxt would be clever in saying, oh yeah, there's a link in some viewport, let's fetch over the JavaScript already, but for taking a look at what it means performance-wise, it's good to not do that. The default is pretty sane, but for the sake of this example, this way we can actually check it easier. And then we have our lazy app footer here with hydrate never, for example. And in other, we do the same, just linking back. Now on server components, this looks a bit different. Well, it's actually the same thing, but using app footer too, no lazy and no hydration, because this is a server component, as we see on the .server.view suffix here. Taking a look at the component itself, it's just very simple footer, my test footer. So there's not like a huge cost of JavaScript involved. It's still an element, still there. And now if we start our application, let's take a look. And we have to differentiate between certain scenarios because we want to take a look at the initial request. So where hydration is relevant. 
and of course also on client side navigation. So going from slash A to slash B or slash index to slash other to see how the components will behave then. All right, we started the index page and we have the option to click on lazy or server component. Now what I will do is a hard refresh on the lazy route to see what will happen there. So we basically emulate the initial request because clicking here would mean I would do client side request. Anyway, let's go. And here we go. A lot of things are loaded. That's kind of expected because, well, this is first of all the dev server. We have a lot of things, they are unbundled, so that's kind of normal. But if we take a look at app footer, which is our component, we see it's not loaded on the initial request. Well, why? Because we set it to hydrate never, which means the JavaScript is not sent over on the initial request. Now, if we do a client side navigation do from slash A to slash B, if we click here, surprise, it is there. But that makes a lot of sense because if you do a client side request, then how would the app, your view or next application in this case, actually render the component without having the JavaScript? Because the JavaScript is still generating the HTML. On the initial request, this already happened on the server side. So it doesn't need to do the same thing on the client side, or maybe later on if you have interactive elements. But if no server side is involved, because while well, we have a client navigation, then that doesn't happen at all which means, well, you need the JavaScript and the JavaScript is loaded. But how does it look like when we use server components? When using server components, we also see a lot of things are fetched and no app footer.js or anything, which makes sense because if it's fetched on the server side, well, first of all, there is no JavaScript involved, right? There is only a server component. The request has been done. And the only thing that was fetched, of course, is if we look for server component, we find that file here. Also, by the way, keep in mind the numbers, it's all without text compression, gzip minification. These are way smaller. For example, the server component JS is like five kilobyte in production. That's just important because the numbers sometimes can be confusing, especially when you test in dev. So don't performance test in dev, please. Don't. I dare you, don't. So no app footer, great, makes sense. We also have no extra fetch request. Okay, that one doesn't count really because that all happens on the server side. It is blended in right during our SSR process. Now, if we take a look at all, we clear all the things and now we click on other, what will happen now? Of course, other.view will load, that makes sense. And that's it, we're, we're kind of done here. So why does that actually happen? Well, the server component is already loaded. We know the state, we can just reuse it. We don't have to do another request. So we can reuse server components that are, for example, fully static because they're cached. Pretty amazing. Also, as I said, no extra JavaScript is loaded besides the actual page, of course. But what if we come from a side like the actual index without a footer to, for example, a side with a server component? Let's emulate it real quick. And to do that, we go back to the index page and then we click on server components. We land on the server component index page. And now we see there is this request to localhost, basically saying app footer to some hash here and the response will be ID, hat, and the HTML that will be inserted and is here. So there, no JavaScript is transmitted. It is just plain JSON and HTML in the JSON. So that also means there is not much JavaScript to execute except obviously inserting that HTML as we've seen before. So that's the main difference between lazy hydration and server components. Server components will always give you the least JavaScript possible, obviously, and lazy hydration, well, that basically means it's only relevant for the initial request where, well, the JavaScript is not needed again or later on because the server rendered it already. Now, you might wonder what's better for your use case, server components or lazy hydration? And the answer is, if you need more static content, a server component is a good way to go. If you only have one or two small components, it might not be worth it. So benchmark that for sure. But if you have a lot of static components, Server components are the way to go because the least JavaScript possible, no matter if it's the initial request or not. If you have interactive components and you just want to make sure that you do the least effort possible, giving also a better user experience and performance, lazy hydration is totally fine. Also, implementing lazy hydration is way easier than transforming everything that you want to to server components. The reason for that is that lazy hydration is a simple directive and you can play around with that, while server components might need more tweaking here and there but still it's worth to try out both. So my TLDR would be go with lazy hydration and then see what might be worth, especially if it's a lot of computational effort to move to the server because 
I don't know, best example is rendering markdown, so to say, or I don't know, syntax highlighting. These are all tasks that are better on the server and that are quite high compute and might also lead to a lot of JavaScript and dependencies. So moving them to the server can have a huge advantage, not only saving a lot of kilobytes, but also CPU cycles and headaches. I hope that helped and uh, you are more clear when it comes to the difference between lazy hydration, especially with hydrate never and server components. Any questions left, drop them down below as usual. And otherwise I hope to see you all next week or the latest Deja View episode where it's a special after one year of Deja View, we do a panel on open source sustainability with Chad Whittaker, Daniel Rowe and Raik von Sanden, of course, also with Michael and me. Check that out, a uh, really amazing episode. I love the flow of that one. And of course, take a look at the older videos. Any other comments, please, as usual, you know where to put them. See you soon, happy hacking.